Okay, so at the end of session three, we briefly mentioned this idea of pulling policy levers or changing the payoffs in a game to make it so that people end up cooperating or in, end up doing kind of a better choice. Um, and so we looked at this example here of the overwatering in California, where you have two farmers that will either use water normally or double their water use. And so what we found is this essentially is a prisoner's dilemma because you have farmers. If, so if you're farmer one and you know farmer two is going to use water normally, then your option is to either use water normally or double your water use. And so the best payoff for you is going to double your water use. If you know that farmer two is going to double their water use, you could either use water normally and get two utils, or you could double your water use and get three utils. And so your choice is to um, also double your water use, which means you're always going to double your water use regardless of what they do. That's a pure strategy. Um, it's a dominant strategy. That's what you're always going to do. And that's bad for society because ideally you want to get to this world where everybody's using water normally, society gets 12 utils of benefit total, but instead it's either going to get 10 or 6, depending on what Farmer 2 decides to do. Um, so if you're Farmer 2, um, you, if you assume Farmer 1 is going to use water normally, you could either get 6 utils or you could get eight if you double your use. And so you're going to double your use here. Um, if you look to farmer one and say, they're probably gonna double their use, you could either use water normally and get two utils, or you could also double your use and get three utils. And so you're gonna choose three because that's the higher payoff, which means you're also going to double water use. The Nash equilibrium for everybody is going to be this three, three defect world where everybody's always going to just double their water use and deplete the water resources in California, and it's gonna be bad. This is the prisoner's dilemma situation. Um, this is this tragedy of the commons. Water is gonna get overused, and the common pool resource is just gonna disappear because the incentives are structured in a way that forces people to double their water use. So, if you're a policymaker in California and you want to get people to use water normally, you have to do something to get this quadrant here to be an attractive quadrant. And so that's where we get into this idea of pulling policy levers. If you can do something to make the six be better than this eight, um, either boost this to like a 10 or something, or if you can change this eight and lower it down to like a four or something, then that will change the benefits of making these choices. And so if you can get this number higher or this number lower, then you'll change the incentives and get people to choose using water normally. So one way you could do this is you could impose a 50% tax on people who double their use of water. If you could somehow measure how much water people are using, um, then you could track that. And if people are using too much water, then you impose a tax. And so what that does, that lets us use this policy lever on this number. This used to be eight, but because we're doubling the, or we're adding a 50% tax on that, then we're going from eight to four. And the three, that's what, that's the payoffs that we were getting before, but now that's one and a half. And so all of these double water use, we just moved them down um, by half. So now if we go through the, the same payoff situation, to see what people are gonna choose. Let's switch back to red here. There it is. So if you're farmer one and you assume that farmer two is going to use their water normally, then you should either use your water normally or double your water use. The higher number now is no longer doubling because there's a tax if you double yours. So you're not gonna want to do that. You're gonna want to use water normally. So that's your option. If farmer two doubles their water use, your best option is either two or one and a half. And so you're going to do two, which means you're going to use your water normally um, because you don't want to pay the extra tax. Um, and so you don't want to end up in that square there. Um, so now, regardless of what farmer two does, if you're farmer one, you're always going to use normal levels of water. And that's because we imposed this tax and we changed the payoffs and it changed the behavior of these different farmers. If we do the same exercise for farmer two here, so we look, if you're farmer two and you say farmer one is definitely gonna use water normally, what should I do? You can either get six points or four points, you're gonna want to get six. So you're gonna end up right there. 
Um, if you know that farmer one is going to cheat and double their water use, you could either get two points or you could um, get one and a half points. And so you're going to also use water normally. And so what ends up happening is this is the Nash equilibrium and it's not a mixed strategy. This is always going to happen. This is the dominant outcome. And so now the whole world is better off because we messed with the, the incentive structure here. And now everybody's always going to use water normally. The tax here raised government, government revenue, sure, but now nobody's doubling their water use, so it's not actually raising much government revenue. Instead, what this tax is doing is it's shifting the incentives around so that people make better choices for society. Now, society is not getting overwatered and it's getting 12 total units of happiness for everybody. Um, and that's really cool that that was able to happen. This is a useful model. Again, it's not super, super accurate. These are all fake numbers again, but it does represent this, this situation where if you change the payoffs, you can create normal water use. That's not the only way to do it. If you, instead of taxing double water use, you provided like tax breaks or rebates or gave people money for using water normally, that would change this number up to like a 10. And even though this would be eight, the incentives would still be up here um, to use water normally because people want those higher payoffs. Um, and so you can either bump these numbers up or bump them down. If you can use policy to somehow change those numbers, then you change the incentives and you actually change the Nash equilibrium and create better outcomes and you get out of prisoner's dilemma land. And so that's why public policy is a really powerful tool in these game theory situations. Um, you can actually fix social dilemmas using these policies here. Um, but there are dangers in doing this. There are possible um, unintended consequences. So let's look at this situation here where you have two actors. You have a government and you have firm owners. And this game is slightly different from what we've been seeing before because now the choices aren't the same. It's not like the government can impose moderate tax rate and the firm owner can also impose a moderate tax rate. Like there are four different options here instead of two different options that we were seeing before. Here we have water, water, double, double. Here we're seeing something completely different. The government can impose a moderate tax rate on businesses and the firm owner can either pay a normal tax or they can hire expensive corporate lawyers to find loopholes in the tax system so that they can avoid paying more taxes. Um, the government can also impose a higher tax rate and the firm owner can either pay that higher tax rate or hire lawyers for the loopholes. So those are the different options you have. Government has two different choices and the firm owner has two different choices. And there's different payoffs that they get from these different situations here. Um, so if we assume that the government currently has this policy here, they have this moderate tax rate that, is, that exists right now. What that means, if so we can ignore this, this high tax rate row here, that's not under investigation right now. We're just looking at the current policy here. So the government is definitely imposing a moderate tax rate. And that is actually a good option for them because they could either get 100 or they're only going to get $85 million in revenue because um, the firms are going to hire lawyers to get through loopholes and they're not going to pay as many taxes. So that's a good situation for the government. If you're a firm owner, you have a choice under this current moderate tax policy. You could either pay the normal tax or you could spend extra money and hire lawyers to get out of the tax. So your payoffs, if you pay the normal tax, you're going to get $500 million of profit or $500 of profit, whatever unit you want here. So that's if you're paying the normal tax, that's how much profit you get as a firm owner. If you decide to hire lawyers for your to find loopholes and stuff, that's expensive. You're going to spend $5 million to get those expensive lawyers. And so your choice here you're going to choose the best outcome for you, which is 500,000 or this 500 here, which means if you're a firm owner at this moderate tax rate, you're going to pay a normal tax um, because spending money to get the, the loopholes isn't going to help you. And so this is the world that we're in. Government is happy with the moderate tax rate. Firm owner is happy with moderate tax rate. That's what the policy is saying is going to happen. So everybody's happy and paying normal taxes. Um, but what happens if the government decides to raise taxes? They decide that they want to raise additional revenue for whatever purposes they want. And so they want to get to this world here, to this desired policy. And so what would happen is if, if they impose this tax, 
they would get 50 million extra dollars. So they're moving from 100 to 150. So that's really good for them. That's great. Um, if you're a firm owner, you're suddenly losing $50 million of your profit here. You're going down to 450 because that extra 50 is coming to the government. So the government wants this to be the best option here. That's what the government wants is that to happen with the policy. So if they set that, what is the firm owner going to do? Um, so we look at the payoffs. The firm owner could pay the normal tax and they would lose $50 million. They still get 450 euros or $450 million, whatever units we want to talk about here. But if they hire lawyers for finding loopholes, um, then this is what they end up doing. They spend $10 million or 10 euros or whatever on getting the, the expensive lawyers. Um, the government gets less money because they found a whole bunch of loopholes here. And so what is the firm going to choose? They're going to choose to hire lawyers because 490 is higher than 450. And so this is what the firm owners are going to do, which means as a result of the government raising taxes in this situation before they were getting 100. They raised taxes because they wanted to get 150. But the Nash equilibrium in this situation says this is actually going to end up happening. The firm owners are going to hire lawyers and the government's only going to get $90 million instead of $100 million. Which means as a result of trying to get to this square here, they actually fall back to this square and earn less money than they had hoped. And so when we say like these equilibriums matter, like in order to have a good policy, you need to choose a policy that will end up um, in kind of a predicted situation for everybody. If you try to get to this world, it's not going to happen because people are going to hire those lawyers. If you really want to get to this world, then you need to change the payoffs here and make it really expensive to hire the lawyers or close the loopholes or do something so that these payoffs um, are lower than the 450 so that they actually pay the normal tax and you get the money. Um, if you don't, then even if this is like a really cool policy and you have like really detailed policy memos and briefs explaining we should raise taxes and hoping that firm owners will pay the normal tax, they're not going to. They're going to hire the lawyers for the loopholes and you'll end up with less revenue and that's bad. So again, a summary of what just happened there. The government's going to try to get to the high taxes and pay normal rate square here. This high tax, pay normal tax. But... They're not going to because the firms are going to hire the lawyers. And so the new outcome is actually worse for everybody. It's worse for the government because um, they're getting fewer, um, they're getting less revenue. But it's also worse for the firm owner. Back in this world, they were getting $500 million in profit. Now they're only getting 490. This is better for all of society here. This is worse, but they're stuck in this world of high taxes and lots of loopholes and it doesn't end up working. So... The new outcome is worse for everybody. In order for a public policy to be effective and not have negative consequences or unintended consequences, it has to be a Nash equilibrium. It has to lead to um, kind of staying in that new quadrant and not pushing people away from what you're hoping for them to do. So if you want to avoid unintended consequences here, you need to make sure that any policy change that you implement doesn't change people's preferences in unexpected ways. Um, and this happens all the time in real life where you'll implement some sort of policy and then people will react to those incentives and behave differently than you expected. But they're not, it's not a random way of behaving. They're just following the incentives. Um, so here's three different examples um, that are, one is fairly common, this example of the Israeli daycare. And these other two um, are things that you can observe in real life when, when policies change. So this Israeli daycare situation, it, um, it's in Freakonomics, it's in Naked Economics, it's in all sorts of different books or podcasts about it, and just because it's like this neat, tidy example of what happens when you mess with incentives. Um, there was a daycare um, in Israel um, where they were struggling with getting parents to show up on time to pick up their kids um, because um, they just kind of had this, this general rule saying, come pick up your kids on time. Um, there's no punishment for it, but please do it so that the teachers can get home on time and, and, and don't be late. 
Um, and so they were worried about having too many parents be late and they had this, this, this wave of lateness. And so what they ended up doing is they said, let's implement a fine system where if parents are late, they have to pay extra money um, as kind of punishment for being late. And that will stop people from being late. And what ended up happening as a result is that more people started being late. And it was because um, it changed this social norm of we shouldn't be late because we don't want to burden the, the daycare teachers into a monetary type of transaction where they could say, it's worth it to me to be late today because I can afford the, the extra money. I can afford the fine. That's fine. And so they're going to purposely be late because the payoffs suddenly switched to the point like before the payoff structure was like based on utility and they didn't want to get negative consequences. They didn't want to be seen um, poorly socially. They didn't want to be seen as somebody who's late and they didn't want to let down the teachers. But as soon as that switched to monetary incentives, then it changed the whole payoff structure. And so people started being late more often because they could afford it. And then teachers ended up having to stay late longer um, because they like they incentivized this whole being late thing. Um, and that was bad. Um, this also happens with um, No Child Left Behind, um, this education policy that was implemented under the George W. Bush administration, where schools are graded um, based on how well they perform on tests. Um, and so that was a purposeful policy change. They, uh, the Bush administration wanted to improve test scores. They wanted students to learn more, um, arguably. And so they created this incentive system where teachers got paid based on how well their students performed. Schools got additional funding and grants depending on how how well all of the students did in aggregate. And so schools that perform really well and do well on tests get more funding. Um, schools that don't do really well are at risk of getting closed and losing funding. And so this incentive structure changed from teach kids so that they can learn into teach kids so that they can perform really well on a test so that we can get money so that we can continue to pay our teachers well and do um, specific activities and stuff. And this distorted all sorts of educational outcomes. Um, nowadays, in elementary schools and beyond, um, schools literally teach to the test. Um, I live in Gwinnett County right now, and the elementary school where my kids go um, focuses entirely on test taking. Um, at one point, they like my second grader was taking a practice test um, four times a week so that he could get really good at testing. And then they would have quarterly tests that were official, like state level tests, but they would also have like um, tests every other week to make sure that they're on track for their quarterly tests and for the state tests um, that happen annually. And the whole structure of the school is set up to maximize testing ability. Um, my oldest daughter is in middle school um, and she faced the same issue in seventh grade where um, in her classes, in her science classes, they're not doing experiments. They are reading past tests, um, a state level test and district tests to make sure that they're covering all of the potential questions. And then they're practicing taking tests and getting really good at taking tests. And that was the whole focus of the school year um, was to be really good at taking tests. Um, and we lived in several other states in Utah and in North Carolina. And that is also, it's not the same intensity as it is here in, in Gwinnett County for whatever reason. Um, but that's also been the case everywhere else we've lived is like, yes, you teach elementary school kids that like how to color and how to spell and how to do all like normal elementary school things. But there's also this looming incentive to do really well on tests. And if you don't do really well, then you lose funding. And so you teach to the test. Um, at one point, um, when we lived in North Carolina, um, my daughter, who was in seventh grade this year, um, she was in third grade, I think. And they like during testing week, they helped they like shut down specific wings of the school and made um, like all the fifth graders had to take this state test. And so they isolated all the fifth graders in one wing of the school. They made sure all of the other students were like far away. Um, they had to rotate which classes were outside. And then they had to like put them on far ends of the playground um, to make sure that they weren't making too much noise to distract the students inside taking tests. Um, and it was like this really bizarre thing that, that they had constructed this whole system to improve test scores because that became the new incentive. Um, the payoff structure was no longer 
teach really well so students can learn. It was teach really well so that they can do really well on tests so that we can get funding and continue to, to teach. Um, and it totally distorted the incentive structure um, because of this game theory idea. And so even though they wanted to improve kind of educational outcomes, what's ended up happening is that didn't line up with, with their policy outcome. It went to a different Nash equilibrium, which was teach through the test and not great. Um, same thing happened with um, the Affordable Care Act. Um, one of the requirements of the Affordable Care Act was that uh, corporations and organizations that have employees that work more than 30 hours have to get um, health care benefits um, and have to, um, the companies have to provide health insurance to them. And so what ended up happening is lots of places that had employees working 30 or 31 or 32 hours suddenly cut their employees' hours down to 29 and a half or 29 hours um, just so that they wouldn't have to pay insurance for them. And this happened everywhere, like at BYU, um, which is like this religious private institution. What ended up happening, my brother-in-law worked at the, at the campus library at 30 hours. Um, and as soon as the Affordable Care Act um, health insurance requirement kicked in, every single one of BYU's 30 hour a week employees got bumped down to 29 um, and he did too and it was this, it was super frustrating because like it was a way for the organization to get out of um, following the policy um, and so even though if we think about it in game theory land um, the intention was organizations that are that have employees that work close to full time should offer their employees health insurance um, and that was the policy target but because of the incentive structure, as soon as that policy came into place, that was not a Nash equilibrium. It was better for organizations to cut their employees' hours just slightly so that they wouldn't have to pay the extra um, health insurance benefits. And so they ended up in this other quadrant of um, people underworking and not getting um, health insurance benefits. And that was kind of the natural outcome of the law because of the, of the policy, because of the structure of the um, economic incentives and the payoffs. And so again, if you're trying to design a policy that's going to improve lives or do something to, to improve outcomes, you need to make sure that it is a Nash equilibrium and that whatever, however you mess with the incentives and change the incentive structures, people will respond the way you hope that they do to that. Um, if the incentive structures are set up in a way that it's cheaper for people to not follow the policy and to get around it, then everybody's going to do that and you're going to end up with negative outcomes and that's going to be bad. Um, so again, we've talked about all this game theory stuff with kind of fake numbers, but in real life, this does happen um, where you end up creating these policies that seem well-intentioned and then people respond weirdly um, to incentives. And it's not really weird and unexpected and random. It is perfectly logical. It is a perfectly rational thing to do to cut your employees' hours by one hour so you don't have to pay extra money for their health insurance. That is the rational outcome. Um, might seem very immoral, but that's that's what you like based on the on the policy preferences or the not policy preferences, the, the policy payoffs, um, that's what's going to happen. Um, and we can see that and predict that using these game theory models.